hi and welcome to the event, um, Newly Qualified and Confused. So this is the second one that we've, we're doing. Uh, the first one was done in summer uh, just to support the newly qualified farms to anyone who's looking to go to, uh, get into, um, into the welcoming side. So the way uh, this webinar normally works is that um, the panel introduce themselves, they tell their stories about how they became, uh, how they got to where they are, um, and then we'll go into an um, Q&A, so you get to ask any questions uh, you want about the about welcoming salaries and how to negotiate better salaries, especially if you're employed pharmacist. So on the panel, we have uh, myself, uh, Toad List, I'm, I'm the founder of the Pharmacist Cooperative. Um, we'll have um, Alistair Jones, uh, he's a GP practice pharmacist. We also have um, Paul Summerfield, who's a trained barrister and a local pharmacist. Um, we have Bilal uh, Anwar, uh, who's a local pharmacist, worked for NHS in various roles, um, currently works for Omnicell as well, and he founded the Curious uh, Locum platform. Uh, we also have Imran Butt, who, who founded the um, Central Consultants Accountancy Firm. So he will talk to us a bit more about accountancy and as a locum, when you need to start setting up your company and uh, tips on how to uh, get it right the first time around. So just to start off, um, so I'll tell a bit more about myself. Um, I qualified in 2005 um, and I went straight into locuming. Um, and one of the pieces of advice that I had from, the, from a regional manager um, was that when you're qualified farms, when you just qualify, rather than going into an employed position, we would like you to first locum. Um, and this is because you can work, after working in various different field, uh, companies, you can understand how they work. You can bring the best of what you've seen around um, to an employment position. Um, and that, stuck, kind of, that really stuck with me um, ever since. And after the locuming for pretty much every company out there in the Northwest and the Northeast side, uh, even down to Midlands and Wales. Um, <clears throat> I've seen some big differences in how the companies treat their staff, how they treat their locums, um, and the companies that treat their staff well, especially the locums. Those are the ones you're going to go work with because they can treat, if they can treat their locums well, they'll treat their staff at well as well. Um, yeah, so in 2016, we founded the Pharmacy Cooperative as a online platform to bring pharmacists together on a, on a single platform. And because of various issues that we were having um, and the, the constant drop in salaries and the locum rates, we needed a platform where we as farms and pharmacists could come together without being harassed by the employers, uh, our locum agencies and coordinators and all sorts. So in 20, 2018, we registered as a uh, cooperative. Uh, the Farms Cooperative uh, was officially uh, born on the 31st of August 2018. Um, and the whole purpose of the cooperative is to bring the pharmacists together, uh, speak on behalf of pharmacists with one unified voice. I mean, as, as long as you're a pharmacist, you can join the cooperative, whether you're employed, whether you work in industry, hospital, um, or even if you're a pharmacy owner, you can still join and nothing stops you from giving your voice uh, and discussing points that are uh, issues that uh, affect you as a healthcare professional. And recently we've done, you've seen a lot of the work that we've done around uh, remote supervision, trying to put, put an end to that one, um, trying to cap university places, um, ensuring locums get a fair deal, ensuring um, employed pharmacists get a fair deal as well. We work with with a lot of organizations, including the PDA, um, to ensure that the pharmacists get the best possible support. Uh, I'm a locum myself, um, part-time and part-time I for the Pharmacy Cooperative. Um, so my most of my time is basically spent online um, dealing with other companies and other organizations. Um, so when I do go to locum, I do still see the issues that we've been talking about for a long time, um, the lack of staffing, the overpressure, that's, that hasn't changed. Um, and our salaries, recently they have gone up, but since 2005, our salaries have constantly gone down. Um, and when I qualified, it was about £25 an hour. And if you put that onto Bank of England uh, website on um, inflation, that rate should be, that equates about £40 an hour. Uh, in 2021 or in 2020. 
But if you ask uh, a company for about for 40 pound an hour, essentially what was the same rate in 2005, you probably get blacklisted. Um, and one of the things we're trying to teach local pharmacists is that you, you are a business. Obviously, we can't tell you what to charge, but we can tell, teach you how to use the market insight, which is why we've, we've set up the pharmacy review where you can review a branch, you can put your salary down. We have a locum rate heat map, so you, you know what the previous rates were uh, in an area uh, before you take a shift. Uh, we're developing the website uh, Circle, which is going to replace our network, our social network, and that will have all the um, locum jobs and um, pharmacy ratings, accountants, everything in one place. Um, but you can still uh, get access to the uh, data on uh, locum rates, the pharmacy reviews, just send us a message on Telegram um, and we'll point you in the right direction. Um, so I want to, I've still got people waiting. Um, so I want to bring on Paul Summerfield next. Uh, he's a locum pharmacist and a trained barrister. Paul. Hi there. And Thank you to everybody who has attended uh, tonight. I uh, know it's a Sunday evening and you may have had other things to do, so we... Um, oh, yeah. it's great to see. I think we're all here. Uh, a lot of coming in to join Can us. everyone please mute their mics? Thank you, Toro. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about my background, how I started. So I, I basically registered in 1997. You know, dinosaurs were still roaming the earth at that point, or it felt like it anyway. Um, came on straight from pre reg as a locum pharmacist, uh, started uh, locuming around, Thanks. thought there must be more to life than this. So I decided to go and do a law degree, then a master's in medical law. Then I read for the bar and I was called to Lincoln's Inn in 2007. Um, I have to make it clear at this point, as Toriel has mentioned, I'm a trained barrister, I'm not a practicing barrister because I don't hold a practicing certificate. I didn't go through the training stage, which is a bit like a pre-reg for barristers. It's called pupillage, which I ne never, never went through. So I've been on the locum scene for the best part of 25 years, and I've seen an awful lot of the good things, but I've also seen an awful lot of the bad things. The, the point is, as Toril mentioned, we're all businesses. And so it's about assigning a worth to yourself and ensuring that to the best of your ability and your negotiation skills, that uh, you put yourself on the market at a rate which is not overly, uh, sorry, no, you're not overselling yourself but you are putting yourself on a rate which companies will say, actually, hold on, that's a decent rate. And that's what I've done for years and years and years. It's all about, for me, it's about longevity. And I'm still welcoming after 25 years. Um, I got called to the bar in 2007. I did a little bit of consultancy work um, with one of the pharmacy insurers. I was superintendent for a short while. I've been in primary care as a primary care pharmacist um, back in the early 2000s. Uh, set up my own company in 2012 to represent pharmacists and other healthcare professionals. And I'm also a lecturer, visiting lecturer at the University of Reading, where I teach law and ethics on the independent prescribing course. So I, I keep myself busy. Uh, and it's good. It's, it, you know, I, I enjoy what I do. My advice would be, you know, yes, you can work as a pharmacist. Absolutely fine. It's about working smarter, not harder. But have that little something extra. Um, as Toril's mentioned, Alistair, who, Alistair, sorry, who's coming on um, shortly, is a GP pharmacist and is an independent prescriber. I'll be embarking on the independent, independent prescribing course in January of next year. Um, I would certainly recommend that when you are all at the point where you can enroll on the IP course, that you do do so. Um, it, it is a game changer, and it is going to mean that we're going to be using more and more of our clinical skills that we've been taught at university, and you're going to be putting those into good use and using them wherever you end up. Um, it's not all about making 
obscene amounts of cash in a short period of time. A lot of pharmacists will turn around and say, oh, I'm, I'm earning 50, 60, 70 pounds an hour. Yeah, they may be, but they're only earning it for a short period of time. Now, that may be good for them. That may be great for them. They may only want to work one day a week. Um, you may want to work five days a week, so you may have to think, well, actually, let's, let's look at this pragmatically and let's make sure that I'm still getting bookings and I'm still working, but I know for a fact when work goes quiet, my bookings aren't going to dry up because I'm doing a good job, but I'm also charging a, a decent rate for that job. And from my experience, I can tell you these high rates, they, they go away in the winter, work quietens down, but local coordinators, no matter which company you are, you are engaged with, local coordinators, agencies will remember. They will remember. If you've tried to charge a high rate, they'll remember. So my advice would be just keep it absolutely real. Don't think, oh, I'll get, you know, I, I won't get out of bed for more than 50 pounds, for less, sorry, than 50 pounds an hour. You're going to be finding yourself in bed for a long period of time. Think about it. Think about it realistically. Um, it's all about longevity. Yes, the Telegram groups, they're great. People, if you ask, will teach you how to negotiate. One of the great skills in negotiation is being able to walk away and not think anything of it. Very hard to do, but once you start doing it, it's actually quite easy. Or go down the route that some of us have gone down, go and get other degrees, put your mind and your effort into other things, have a portfolio of work. Don't just rely on one income stream. And that's, you know, I, I, I now don't rely just on local pharmacy. I do rely on other income streams, and that works for me. may not work for everybody. But from an old timer, as I consider myself, that's the way I've survived for 25 years and hopefully will survive for another 25 years. I could go on and on and on about the experiences I've had as a, as a advocate and as a representative or as a pharmacist, but we've only got a very limited amount of time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand back over to her. I will introduce the next speaker, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions. So please do ask questions if you have any, and I'm sure myself and the other panelists will help. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> I just want to reiterate re re about what... Uh... Paul just said about the locum rates. Um, <clears throat> they do vary, and um, I think it depends on the uh, area that you're working. So major cities <clears throat> like London, Birmingham, Manchester, they'll have lower rates in general because there's a lot of pharmacists who are nearby, especially if there's a school of pharmacy there, you'll probably get a lower rate. Uh, but if you are willing to travel further out, if you're willing to do emergencies mainly, then you'll probably get higher rates. Um, <clears throat> I did a shift last Friday um, for Tesco, and that was a two-hour drive. Um, and I negotiated 45 plus two and full mileage. But again, it was a two-hour drive there, two-hour drive back. Uh, so you can get those rates. You just have to know when the right, uh, you know, when the right time is, um, and how far you're willing to travel. Okay. Uh, and one of the things I'd say about locoming is that. You really, especially if you're doing emergency locoming, you have to be prepared to walk into anything. Um, and that's essentially the job of a, of, a, of a locum, that you could go into any environment and you could keep a cool head and you could work through the day. You're not there to run the place. You're not there to manage that company. You're there just for that day to make sure the services that they do continue. So you need to be uh, trained on all the services anyway. Uh, so if you're mainly working in England, <coughs> make sure you do all your CPE courses. And if you're in Scotland, sorry, in Wales, then do the ones that are specifically for Wales. Uh, if you go into Scotland, then make sure you, you're aware of the uh, all the courses and all the training that you need for Scotland uh, and the PVG as well, which is th their version of the DBS. Um, so these are things, we've got articles written about all this stuff on uh, on our website, on the pharmacistcob.co.uk. 
Um, and there's a little article on how to work in England, how to work in Scotland, how to work in Wales. Uh, you can get all the information on that. Uh, but I want to bring on next uh, Alistair Jones, um, a GP practice pharmacist with a lot of experience uh, in various fields as well. Uh, over to you, Alistair. Uh, well, thank you. But before I start, Paul has his hand up. So I don't know if he wants to uh, chime in before I start rolling. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, thank you, Alistair. Um, Total, you mentioned plus two before. Now, to the uninitiated, that would yeah. just, like, just be a figure. Could you explain what that is to you? Yeah, so the, the, the plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, depending on what you negotiate, is um, the travel time. So if you negotiated £45 an hour, uh, but like in my case, it was a four hour drive there and back. I said, uh, I usually start off with plus four to cover the four hours driving. Uh, and that plus four is uh, four hours at the same rate that I'm working at. So it'd be four, another four hours on top at 45 pound. Uh, we eventually negotiated onto plus two. So I was paid for the full um, 11 hours plus another two hours um, at, at the same rate. Um, and that's that's another way you can negotiate if it, if you're having to travel a further than <coughs> sorry if you're having to travel more than an hour, or even if it's an emergency, you can still say look, it's an hour's drive there, hours drive back. Um, I need two hours covering uh, because technically uh, you are still working while you're driving. You're going to work, um, so that's uh, another way of negotiating. Yeah. So thanks for that. Uh, yeah. On to you, Alistair. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, so, yeah, my name is Alasdair Jones. Um, my substantive post at the moment is as a lead PCN pharmacist. That's a primary care network for those who aren't familiar uh, down in Kent in England. Um, I uh, also hold roles with the PDA union on their national executive. Um, I also sit on the national board for the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, as does Paul, but uh, uh, work, work closely with him on that. Um, the um, my sort of the bulk of my background is from full time employed positions. Um, I've mostly worked in hospital and primary care. Uh, I've never been employed in community, but I do occasionally still locum in community. I've always done some level of locuming. Um, uh, more when I was newly qualified, less so now, um, but. Again, I've seen a wide spectrum um, on my patch of, of, uh, sort of pharmacies to work in. And it's still quite useful, even though I don't work in community pharmacy day to day. It's given me, it's, it, it's given me a good foundation of, of, to, to understand uh, what goes on in community pharmacy, because I do have to work with them sort of on a fairly regular basis. Um, and um, also by doing it occasionally, it just keeps my, my toes in the water, understand what the current issues are. Um, going back initially, um, so before I sort of move on to my, sort of my current roles, I, um, talking about sort of the pharmacist cooperative uh, in particular, um, I, um, I uh, joined uh, the pharmacist cooperative, very, um, I think almost for its initiation, um, and prior to joining this group of people, essentially with a, with a common aim of kind of sharing collective knowledge and, and supporting each other, I really didn't have a very good awareness of... Um, Are you going? Where? Oh, does somebody agree? <laughs> um, can, I can somebody agree. Get the mics. <laughs> the... Um, uh, I, I when I first qualified, I qualified back in 2014. Um, the when I first started locuming, I had really no idea that you could negotiate um, your rate. And looking back now, that seems ludicrous. As someone who's self-employed, you of course have that ability. But um, I and, and it turns out a lot of others did not realise that this was something you could do. Um, and you know, of, of course, as someone's as, as Paul's just put in there, you know, agencies and the companies that are trying to hire you, of course, they have a vested interest in paying you as little as possible. So they're not going to volunteer any information that means you're going to get paid more. Um, and so it's important for all of us to support each other and educate each other um, about um, what our worth is as pharmacists, essentially. 
Um, and expanding a little bit on what Paul said, um, yes, that you know we, we don't want to price ourselves out of the market. Um, but similarly, there is a wide range of, um, should we say, capabilities. Um, but there's you know a, a, there's a spectrum of people that you know will, will turn up in a pharmacy and. Um, if you are someone who is hardworking and, and can offer extra services um, down the line, perhaps you are a prescriber and you can offer something in that sense, um, you know, you're going to get booked again and again. Companies do value that generally, certainly the smaller multiples and independence in my own personal experience. Um, to move on a little bit from locuming, because um, there are others with, with more to say on that, um, my, so my my main background is my, my current background is primary care, and I have worked in hospital for a few years as well. Um, the again the pay pay as an employed position is obviously um, less open to, uh, to well pay within an NHS role is has there's no negotiation really. There's agenda for change, pay scales, and that's it. There, there's no room for flexibility. Uh, but once you start getting into um, the private sector, which, of course, is where GPs reside, they, they, they form part of the NHS in the same way that community pharmacies do, but they are still private businesses. It then very much is up to you to negotiate uh, your salary. Um, now, of course, you'll be told various things. Well, this is the market rate and, you know, well, we, we can't pay above this. And, but that ultimately is a business choice. And you should feel free to walk away if you don't feel that that matches what you feel you're worth. Um, it's, it doesn't serve to be overly ambitious, certainly, um, but you, um, uh, having an awareness of what you can bring to the table is important. So, for example, um, my when I joined PCN, my, my current PCN role, I brought with me prior primary care experience. And there weren't many of us at the time. Of course, there's quite a lot now. But at the time PCN started, I was, um, um, relatively speaking, one of the few, certainly ones that were moving into PCNs. And so that was a, a big selling point um, for the organisation, for me personally. Um, and since then, I've now completed additional training. Um, the CPP pathway, of course, I, I had to do that. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, all of the PCN roles require you as part of the funding to do an 18-month pathway through CPP. I've also become an independent prescriber. Um, all of these things should increase your value to an organisation, um, but they're not going to volunteer to pay you more. It is up to you um, to seek. Um, to, 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 to negotiate that. Um, again, I definitely think there's something to be said for expanding your role a little bit outside um, your day-to-day -day job, um, uh, even if it's not something that pays that much. Uh, the, you know, sometimes it's about um, soft skills, transferable skills, things that you could use in sort of perhaps a future stage in your career. Um, I think there's some, definitely something to be said for training in areas that are allied um, to pharmacy. Um, I, um, I think um, um, it, I, I, I know of several people that have gone into law, uh, like Paul. Um, increasingly, I think things like genomics are going to be a very big area for pharmacists and people who get in early on that are going to be in an ideal situation. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I think my take home message, and I said, I, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards, but my message to all of you would be, um, look for organizations that are going to offer you support, um, pharmacist cooperative PDA, um, you know, make sure you join, you know, you're going to need indemnity insurance anyway, you know, the PDA is going to give you free union membership. So that just makes sense. Um, the pharmacist cooperative opened my eyes to things I wasn't aware of to begin with. You know, just having that support of, of peers, um, you know, was was particularly useful for me. Um, it's not just for locums. Obviously, there are benefits of the organisation that particularly um, suit locums. But as I said, I don't do that much locuming, and, and I'm a member. Um, so uh, my hat off to uh, to Hedel for for setting that up. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, um, 
that would be my sort of main message. And um, before I start rambling too much, I'll pass back to Tahidal. I'll answer any questions a bit later on. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I hope you forget you guys found that. Oh, let me get the words out right. Hope you found that useful. Um, I think I'll just give some really good uh, points around um, negotiation and, and the rates. Um, I think it's right. I think some people do get very um, overly ambitious about the rates. Um, and I've seen some people who will accept shift and then as soon as they get a better rate, they'll cancel uh, with a day's notice. Um, and that's very, very unprofessional. Um, I think if you're going to if you're going into low coming, your reputation is is very, very important. Um, you go in any, into any environment, you deal with it. And when it comes to accepting rates, whatever you've accepted, you've accepted. Yes, the companies do sometimes uh, cancel shit from the last minute for various reasons, but that's them. You need to make sure you uh, maintain your uh, professionalism. Um, and if you've accepted a rate, take it on the chin, someone else giving you a better rate, then there's other people who can do it. Uh, and you can do it next time. Hopefully you can negotiate better rate next time. Um, but as I said, mark insight is the most important thing. Speak to your peers, ask them what the past rates were uh you can't talk about future rates that be rate uh, market setting and there's a there are laws around uh ensuring people don't talk about future rates but there's no harm in asking about past rates um there's got quite a few questions we will get to you guys um but first i want to bring um Bilal into uh into this and talk about a bit of his experience and why he set up the um curious locum platform but i'll love to uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I was like Tahidol who qualified in 2006. So I feel like a veteran of this game. Um, so I have been locoming. I've done exactly what Paul said, what Tahidol said, went into locoming. Um, but I knew from day one I was a business. Um, and I needed to make sure I was actually working all the time. So, yes, started off with uh, lower rates than most people, but I very quickly learned how to negotiate. So uh, just to say, um, I've worked solely on my own most of the time um, just to make sure I can negotiate. I very quickly learned agencies make money out of me. Um, so I went direct to companies, which a lot of people weren't aware of. And I'll echo again what Paul, Alistair, everybody's saying. Um, there came a time in the locoming world that rates did drop and work was very hard because we had this whole uh, influx of new universities, um, foreign pharmacists, uh, whichever way you look at it. So you have to go and reinvent yourself. So what did I do? I'm one of the first pharmacists, I'd say, who went into healthcare automation. So anybody knows a bit about robots, ward automation, I done that. So to get to that, I've actually worked in hospitals. So I've worked on wards. I've worked in GP practices. I've actually worked in care homes and home care, which a lot of people don't know the difference of. Home care is slightly different from care homes. And I got to automation uh, I work for BD Rower, so a lot of people might know them. Uh, I used to work for Care Fusion, now they know them as BD. Um, and that then led me into a path of project management. So I've done healthcare IT project management, wrote business cases for um, hospitals, private organizations. I've also been a chief pharmacist for urgent care, um, head of prison services. So I've done senior roles in the NHS, but also project management. Um, so hence, I've got a lot of strings to my bow. Um, I can get varied income in regards to what I do. Very recently, I was also headhunted by DHSC. So I've worked for the DHSC as well. So on the test and trace program, which a lot of people would be like, how did a pharmacist get on there? But to be honest with pharmacists, ev they're everywhere. So a lot of people say work for GP practices, work for hospital. There are environments where pharmacists are not known, but you can work there. There's consultancy. All these big four, uh, I guess I'll say the big four accountancy companies, any strategy company out there, they will hire clinicians um, because the next big thing is to actually provide consultancy to the NHS. And we've seen it because unfortunately, the way the NHS is run is a bit, I'd say, still run a bit uh, inefficient. Um, so they need us people to help them uh, to show them how it's done. But I'm still a locum in the background. So I still negotiate rates. Um, I every so often do locum. I don't locum as much now. Um, I do a lot of other things. So my full-time role, 
um, is for Omnicell. I guess you guys might have heard of Omnicell. Um, so I am one of the regional business. I am a regional business manager down in the south. So how did my journey with Omnicell start is because I implemented the, their first ever robot in this country. Um, and they've been trying to get me to work for them for many years. So they finally got me. And um, so I do work for them. But the flexibility is that you can do other things on the side. Um, and that's that's something very important to me because I like doing other things as well. So it keeps keeps me ticking over. Hence, it leads up and leads me to the Curious app. Just like everybody's been touching on it, negotiating agencies agencies make a lot of money out of us regardless of what environment you work in whether it's it i work in healthcare it they will make money out of me whether i work in a hospital whether i work in a gp practice or community they are there to make money for themselves and also save money for the organization so the idea of curious app was actually to provide a platform where you can directly link yourself to the organization um, and actually have a negotiating feature as well um, it's very simple the organization puts a job on, you're registered, you see the job. It's based on locality. So you would actually put a mile radius in, uh, you put a ra radius in, your travel radius in within the application. Um, and it goes down to what the guys have already said. If you're willing to travel, you get paid more. If you're not willing to travel, you get paid that much less. But then you caveat that how much your petrol costs, what's your insurance costs, et cetera. So how much mileage you add into your car. So these are the type of things that you'd think, think of. Um, it's also got the negotiation feature on it, just like to give that human effect, the fact that you actually, you can. So if somebody puts a 25 pound hour rate on there, it doesn't mean it's, it's actually 25 pound an hour. You can actually negotiate more and it gives that opportunity to actually liaise with uh, the organization, because what a lot of locums do struggle with is picking the phone up and actually saying, I want this much money. Um, and unfortunately, emails are great. But what happens with emails is there's going to be 20 million, 20 odd emails for the same job. Um, and do you actually get that job? You don't know. You're still waiting for an email to come through after about an hour or so. And you're just sitting there thinking, am I going to get this job? So that's the idea of application. I think a lot of us are and generally, you see it in the Uber market, you see in other markets, Uber, Uber Eats, nobody actually thought of the way of this, this would actually work years ago. We used to walk to a uh, takeaway, bring our food. That's exactly the same concept that we're trying to uh, create here. So initial traction is community pharmacy, and then towards, we're gonna do primary care as well. So guys, when you actually register, hopefully you will register, there's the compliance part of the app, uh, the app. It looks like there's a lot of compliance. That compliance is not only for community pharmacy, but it's also for hospital and primary care. So we're just kind of gearing you up because at the moment we're looking at, we're actually working with community partners. The idea is to work with primary care partners as well. And with that experience I do have, and I think Alistair did touch on primary care, but there's another sector added to primary care is urgent care. It is struggling. I used to be the chief pharmacist in Barking Haven and Redbridge. Uh, down in the south, they haven't got enough clinicians to even cover the shifts. It is that it can be that bad. Um, so, and and if it's about rates, the rates are a lot higher in urgent care. Yes, there's a lot more responsibility, but the rates rate. If you're if you're solely about rates, that will be higher there. But with higher rates comes higher responsibility. It comes with more risk, and that's something you have to be aware of. And even as a locum myself, the advice I would give to anybody is, if you're gonna go in to do a locum, make sure you do a good job because they will call you back. Yes, the rates are very important, but if you do a good job, they will call you back and never leave a, a relationship broken with any organization. So I get a lot of repeat work, whether it's through my project management, whether I do a full-time role, or if I do any kind of, any, any kind of role, even locum role. So yes, there's other sectors that, and I can give you the advice because I've never even said it now. I've worked on EPMA, EPR systems, and there's a national, as much as there's a shortage of pharmacists, I can tell you in that in that process, there's a massive national shortage because we're moving toward this whole electronic working method of working. I, I think Alistair's worked in hospitals. Um, he will tell you auto, EPMA is quite a big thing at the moment in hospitals. Um, and guess what? They haven't got the staff to do it. So there is a lot of opportunity out there as long as you guys are willing to go out there to learn. And it doesn't mean I've never done an extra degree. 
I've never done an extra course in my life. I've never done anything extra. All I've done is made sure I do what I can do and learn from other people as well. So there's different ways of working. So everybody's got a different way of working. No, I've not done the, I've not even done the independent prescribing course, but I've got a different niche from Alistair. So I got a different set of skills, uh, skills that I, I possess. So the idea is you can do a lot of things. Um, it's just, you need to make the effort, put the time in and just learn from different people as well. And if you need advice, Tahidul and me know each other since about seven years now, six or seven years. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been a long time. So he will tell you, I'm a complete different way of a standard pharmacist that works standardly. But yes, I can still locum. I can still go. If you put me into community pharmacy, put me into anywhere. And I'm ready to walk into anything. So a couple of weeks ago, I walked into, into a pharmacy, no names taken. And they had so much work to do. But the end, by the end of the shift, I had finished the work because that's what they're paying you for. Um, but unfortunately, there are the element of you, you. There was a saying. I don't know if you guys are going to agree with it. There was a saying called the newspaper locums. And what that meant is they would pick up a newspaper and sit in the corner and hardly do any work. What that gives us is a bad, bad reputation. And yeah, that's what locums are. Nice, lazy locums, isn't it? They're, that sit on yeah. the phone all day. Yeah, so effectively, guys, if you're going to do a shift, give your best. If you don't want to do it, just don't book it. That's the way I look at it. And remember, everybody knows this game of poker. Locuming is like poker. And if you're going to negotiate rates, you got to be willing to take a no as well. And again, Paul said it, willing to walk away from a shift, knowing when it's right for you and when it's wrong for you as well. That's my uh, kind of a uh, brief introduction, but I will be at the pharmacy show. Come along to the Omnicell uh, stand. Come say hello. I'll introduce you to a few other guys, um, ladies and gentlemen there. So, you know, uh, different ways of working. Um, so guys, I hope that's useful. Thanks, Bilal. Um, and I think uh, I want to touch on before we introduce uh, Imran and talk about the accounting side, um, the salary negotiation for the um, employed positions. Now, not sure if you've seen the uh, messages on Twitter Reese, uh, a couple of days ago about the three large employer organizations that came together and said uh, the starting salary of a newly qualified pharmacy could be between anything between twenty five to thirty five thousand. Uh, that was about about well, fifteen years ago, twenty years ago. That would have been a starting salary, um, but right now uh, most of the and, uh, and through the figures that we've got on Pharmacy Review, mo- the average pharmacy salary is around. 47 to 60,000. Uh, as a newly qualified pharmacist, you are no less responsible than someone who's been qualified for 30 years. So when you start a job, you'll be just as responsible. You'll be doing just the same thing. Yes, you'll have less experience, but you get paid to take the risk. And as a pharmacist, you shoulder all the risk of that pharmacy. Anything that goes wrong, it's on you. So the starting salary isn't 25 to 35,000, it's closer to 50,000 um, as a newly qualified pharmacist. But one thing you need to be aware of in community pharmacy, you kind of go in and you hit the ceiling of salary and that's where you pretty much stay. Um, busier pharmacies will pay a bit more. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of pharmacists who earn 80,000 plus um, to manage a branch, but those are very, very busy branches. Um, and it also depends on what you negotiate. You can also negotiate the um, a yearly bonus. Uh, I know one pharmacist who, I think six months after qualifying, he took on a uh, superintendent position um, and he was offered £75,000 per year plus 10% uh, bonus on uh, profits. So um, again, it's just like, it's just like welcoming. You can negotiate uh, the salary um, as an employed pharmacist as well. Um, Again, ask, ask your peers. Uh, we are doing research. I know we are constantly asking people to give us feedback on what they're on uh, and we're releasing those uh, to our members. So, um, yeah, so with the, with the uh, employed pharmacist, uh, that'll be the same. Uh, you have to negotiate. I just want to bring on Imran, Imran next. Um, but before I bring him on, I just want to ask um, any locums or newly qualified pharmacists out there, what do you think is the best time to register your company? or register yourself as a locum? Hi, Total. Um, I'm Imran Butt from Central Consultants. I'm the general manager there. 
and we specialize in locum and contractor uh, clients. We've got over two, currently just over 200 locum pharmacists who we do out the accounts for. Um, the best time to seek out an accountant would normally be two weeks to a month before doing your first shift, um, especially if you're going to be doing locum work as your full-time employment because uh, more than likely it would be beneficial to have a limited company rather than being a sole trader. And if that's the route you're going to go down, then you do want to get the limited company form and then the business bank account open before you do your first shift. So the, which would, at the moment, some of the major banks are taking four or five weeks to even, even open up a business account. Um, so definitely two weeks to a month before your first shift you'd want to get that arranged. Right, Imran, I think you, you're gonna go into a bit more detail about the uh, account, how to set yourself with an, account, with an accountant and how to set the company up and when is the best time to um, get things prepared. Um, so uh, in terms of setting up a limited company, either, Whichever accountancy you join with, normally they would form the limited company for you um, just to make sure that all the shares and, and whatnot are, are allocated correctly for you. Uh, uh, and again, you'd want to do that two weeks to a month before your first shift so that the company is all formed, registered, um, and it's active. And also you then um, have opened up the business bank account and you've got your account number and sort code, and you're ready to provide that to the pharmacies from your very first shift so that you can be as tax efficient as possible. Because there is, if you're doing local work uh, full-time, which like pretty much everyone said at the moment, the rates are really high. So locums are earning between 50 and 60,000 in a year. If you hit those kind of numbers and you didn't form a limited company, you're looking at a tax bill, of anywhere between 15 and 20,000 pounds as a sole trader on 50 to 55,000. This, this is quite a lot as a sole trader because basically it's not much different than if you were just employed. Uh, if you did that through a limited company, you're looking at around five to 7,000 pound tax bill. So it's, it's quite a difference, but you'd have to set that up before doing your first shift. You couldn't work an entire year and then decide I want to have a limited company and have all that income. And I think company. that's sorry, 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 I think that's one of the uh, biggest issues that we've seen. Uh, we've had a lot of locums who've been locking for almost six, eight months, uh, almost a year, um, and it's time to pay. I've, I've actually met someone who's, who's been locking for three years and never paid any tax because they weren't aware of it. But that's an extreme case. Um, but if you're going to start <coughs> locking, you need to you need to basically make sure you you're set up with a accountant as soon as possible. Yeah, I'd agree. Right. Uh, uh, the sooner the better. Whoever you join, if you want to go with somebody local um, or, or, or somebody who you've been recommended by family or friends, but you best stop getting advice right from the start just to make sure you're uh, tax compliant and you know, you're, you're tax efficient at the same time. Um, we've got a question. Um, how does IR35 impact? Well, at the moment, uh, it's not really had much of an impact since it's come out uh, for locum since April of this year. IR35 has been around for a long time. Um, it's just in 2017 they made a change. Uh, first, with the, uh, you know, the, uh, basically the main change was that it's no longer down to the locum or the client to decide if they're inside or outside IR35 it's now down to the employer. So for pharmacists, that would be the pharmacies now decide if you're inside or outside IR35. Um, majority of the pharmacies that have done the analysis, they consider local pharmacists to be outside of IR35. Um, it's, 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 uh, there's only Lloyds and Asda who are not saying you're inside IR35. They're just saying they're only going to pay you as a sole trader. So they basically decided we're not going to pay you through a limited company. So if you think, again, it's something that would need to be discussed, but if your majority of your shifts were going to be for ASDA 
And lawyers then, it's debatable if it's worth having a limited company since they won't pay you into a limited company. But And all they mean by what, what it means to be inside or outside IR35 is if you're inside IR35, you're basically paying the same tax rate as an employee, but without any employee benefits. But like I said, most, uh, if you go on the government website and you do even your own personal analysis of yourself, it does show locums to be outside IR35. Um, would you still recommend getting an accountant if working as a sole trader or is it practical to do the taxes uh, yourself? Uh, e- either one. If it's as a sole trader, it is possible to do your own through the government website. Um, if you're aware of all the do- deductions, then you would essentially get the tax bill down to the same figure an accountant would be able to but you would need to be aware of all the legal deductions you are able to do. Um, and what about um, a limited company? Can they do their own account to give their limited company? Not, not as a limited company. Then there would be a conflict doing your own accounts as a limited company. So that would need to be done by an accountant. Um, and at what salary bracket would you say um, it's worth jumping from a sole trader over to a limited company? For us, based on our fee, we uh, the break point is eighteen thousand. Anytime you're earning over eighteen thousand, which any local doing it, even part time would be earning, it would be more tax efficient. If as long as you're not working for anybody else, so you're not employed by any other company, and you only do local work, so that you're able to be employed by your own company, it's worth it from eighteen thousand. Okay. Um, I think I've got a question from Zayn Ahmed. What would you recommend for someone who works part time as a locum like Alistair? Um, I think in that case, it depends on how much you're expecting to earn over the year. Um, because if you've got an employed position, you're paying taxes through your, uh, through your employer. And then if you're locuming on the side, if it's just the odd days, once a month, you're probably not worth registering as a limited company. Um, but it, it all depends uh, on how much you earn. So uh, I'd say have a speak to an accountant afterwards to get the exact figure and what works out uh, because you only need information from your from yourself um, and everyone's case is uh, different. Um, if you are employed full time and only locum part time, would you still be able to start a limited company, or would it be better to locum as uh, a sole trader? So you still can form a limited company if if you're doing it part time. But again, like Tohidol said, it all comes down to your income. So we do have a locums that only work two days a week. And they, because of the, their day rate, they still make um, almost £30,000 in a year just by doing it uh, in their uh, spare time, in a sense. So for them, still would be worth making a limited company. But then on the other hand, we do also have locums that do it part time, but only um, earn just under 11000 then it wouldn't be worth it. You'd be better off doing a self-assessment. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I've got so many questions here. Um, so I think we've answered that one about working part-time and setting up a new company. Uh, what would you advise for locums that do, do not locum full-time, but like I was in part-time, we've answered that one. Um, A lot of similar questions. Uh, I think you've covered most of these. Um, so I'm asking, what will the implication if you start your limited company two months after locuming? You just would have to declare the first two months as a sole trader. And uh, that's one of the reasons why you wouldn't want to leave it too long because the taxes on uh, as a sole trader are higher than through a limited company. But once you form the limited company, then it's one of those sooner the better kind of thing. Especially um, if you're doing it full time. Someone's asking, um, some companies such as Val and Lloyds won't pay into the company account. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, how do you work around this? Well, actually do pay into limited company accounts. It's only Lloyds, Asda, and I think Superdrug um, that don't pay into limited company accounts. Uh, the only work, work around is, <coughs> Sorry. is not to work for them uh, if you don't feel it's worth it. Uh, Pretty much every other company in the country will accept um, you working as a limited company. It's only three or four companies like Lloyd's, uh, Superdrug, and Asda 
um, that don't accept you. So, I mean, there's plenty of work out there. Um, if you're not happy to work for them, try somewhere else. Um, Uh, Elaine, um, we can do the DBS checks for you through our website. So uh, if you need any web uh, DBS for vaccination, just have a look at our website on this under the services tab. Um, can you transfer the money from you to the company account to personal account or would you be taxed twice? Yeah, no, you absolutely can transfer money from your limited to your personal. personal. Um, just has to be in a tax efficient manner. So for locums that are doing it, full time, then we would set them up with a salary. So they'd get a salary at the end of the month. So they would transfer their salary from their business account to their personal account. Uh, and the other benefits of being a limited company is that you're able to reimburse yourself because you work for your limited company for your mileage, which is at 45 p a mile for the first 10,000 miles and meal allowance. So it's quite a generous rate and you're able to transfer that at the end of each month. Okay. Um, I want to see if there's any questions for any of the other uh, panelists. I think we've covered quite a bit on accounting. Um, and if you want to speak to Imran directly, I'll, I'll leave the number um, or uh, his contact details. I can email them out to everyone uh, who've registered. Um, so agencies are the are the agencies that are booked. which companies are best to work for as a locum. Um, I mean, we do, uh, on, on pharmacy, we, we do have a rating system. Uh, so far from what I've seen in the past two years, all the data that we've gathered, the best ones are usually the independents and the smaller companies. Uh, they tend to look after the pharmacies better. Of all the big multiples, they're all essentially the same. Um, I've not come across anyone who's thought, you know, really highly of um of of the big multiples um some branches are good they're really good to work in some branches are really bad so it's, it's a mixed bunch uh some area managers are great to work for, uh, with uh some aren't so in terms of which companies are best i think it's more down to which ph indi individual pharmacy is better to work in um like i said some are great some aren't um, if you go on our on, on the network um we do have the reviews <coughs> Uh, we do have reviews of, of a lot of the branches, um, so we can we can give you that information um, on any specific branches that you may have. Uh, again, that the, the actual site where you can read the reviews will be um, gone. Will be going live soon as well, so you'll be able to check that individually. Um, uh, Total, if I could just uh, chip in here. There's been a couple of questions. I think the Imran will be better to answer this. A couple of questions regarding getting paid in to your personal account as a sole trader, then transferring to the business account. Imran, what would you advise on that? It's quite messy you, in my understanding. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to do that because as the Lloyds, essentially them paying you only into a personal account, they, they're saying that you're a sole trader, they're deciding for you, we're treating you as a sole trader, basically saying we're not dealing with limited companies. You then couldn't put the, so, you wouldn't be able to claim meals or, or mileage for those shifts because you're working as a sole trader. Um, and then you couldn't, you, you couldn't then transfer the money into your uh, business account because uh, it, it wouldn't be correct because it's not a bit, you know, Lloyd's or Asda hadn't paid you into a limited company. So you couldn't all of a sudden make it look like it's business income and you're paid as a sole trader. We would need to declare that income separately on a self-assessment. Uh, are there any other questions, Paul? Paul? No? Okay. Uh, I'm just going through the questions here uh, to see if there's anything that we haven't answered yet. Um, how does one go, one get the details of the coordinators? This is from UJ. Um, I've heard, I've heard go to the stores and ask and what, uh, which we have done, but hardly ever get an info on when do you email or phone, nothing comes of it. So I'm wondering uh, if there's an, any public area on the TPC forum where you can get the information. Um, the best thing to do is um, contact the head office directly. So Boots, Lloyd's, Well, um, and pretty much any pharmacy out there, rather than going to the individual branches, uh, which works great if, you, if you're going to the actual independent pharmacy owners. 
um, the with the multiples, you really want to go straight to the companies, uh, call them at the head office and say you want to register with them. Um, there is also obviously Curious uh, as a local platform, they'll have a lot of jobs on there, so you can register with them um, and see all the latest shifts that come up. Um, like I said, going to individual branches is probably not the most efficient way to find work. There's a lot of work out there, um, and we do advertise a lot of those jobs on our platform, uh, on the on the Telegram platform. Um, but most of the jobs going forward from tomorrow, they'll be posted on the members group first for at least a full day before they're posted on the open network. So if you want to get shifts um, or have access to the largest number of shifts, we you'll probably you, you will have to join the members group and get access to all those shifts from there. Um, but I would generally recommend going direct uh, instead of going to company. There's a lot of agencies out there, thousands of them. Uh, but not all of them are that good to work for. Uh, most of them will try and bring your rates down. They won't negotiate for you or they won't make enough. Uh, but we've had some large, uh, one of the, some of the largest um, agencies threatening locums uh, who wanted to negotiate higher rates. Uh, had one guy who was, he only asked for £35 an hour from Boots. And the agency threatened them, said, if you keep asking for these rates, we'll report you to the GPHC for profiteering. Which is completely, uh, completely unprofessional. It's not even within their uh, area of remit. GPC, it's got nothing to do with them. It's between you and the company. So, <coughs> sorry. So just be careful who you work for. Um, and like I said, we have got a um, a top ten list of uh, the best local agencies. Have a look at that, um, and just avoid the ones near the bottom of the table. Um, could you please expand on what you mean by keeping a portfolio for work? Um, Alistair, do you want to take that one? Sorry, what question was that? Uh, could you please expand on what you mean by keeping a portfolio of your work? <clears throat> um, does that mean in terms of a port portfolio working, as in working in different things, or as in a literal portfolio of things no, I, I think, write uh, now that I I've done? The the, the farms that work in different, um, why uh, different areas? So if you work in academia, if you work as a GP practice, or uh, if you work in the community, I think they're termed now as portfolio pharmacists. Oh, right. So, so I, I think um, the, the, the term portfolio pharmacist, um, it, it, it refers to a portfolio of work rather than the need to create, a, to have a physical portfolio. Um, but there are lots of pharmacists now um, myself included really who who don't like to do the same job five days a week um i'm quite lucky in that my job is quite a varied um because i have quite a, a management heavy type of role i have a mixture of um clinical managerial operational strategic um and that's uh, and on top of that i also have my roles of the rps the pda um and a few other bits and bobs outside nothing to do with healthcare um the um, I would say in order to develop a portfolio career, if that was more of the focus of the question, um, it helps to have a little bit of experience in each area first. Um, or um, the other option is to go for a variety of part-time roles. Um, but probably in hospital, those don't, those aren't that common, I wouldn't say from personal experience. Within general practice, I'd say they're a lot, they're more flexible. Um, community pharmacy, I have never been an employee, employee in community pharmacy, but I would imagine there are some of those. I, I know people who have done part-time roles in community. But having an idea about uh, having some experience <coughs> in each that you want to go into will certainly put you in good stead for developing more of a portfolio career later on. It's not to say you can't do it from the start. I'm sure it's possible. Um, Things like academia are more difficult to get into initially if you've got no teaching experience, I would say, um, because you, as, as Paul does, you know, he's brought in because of his expertise in law and ethics uh, that he's built up over a career. Um, I do have some experience in academia, but that was when I was doing postgraduate um, study full time and then you just get dragged into it um, and then you, you're expected to do some teaching. 
Um, so if you do decide to go and do something like a PhD um, or, um, or some other sort of postgraduate full-time study, um, that's quite a good inroad into academia, if that's something that interests you. Um, alternatively, there are lots and lots of teacher practitioners um, uh, that universities rely on. So if you live reasonably close to a university, there are quite often those kind of roles available. Okay. Um, um, if that doesn't quite answer the question, please do put it in the chat and I'll expand a little bit more. Um, what's the best way to get into GP practice? To get your foot into <laughs> GP practice? Um, there is no best way, I wouldn't say um i there are certainly ways that make it easier um i have hired several pharmacists over the last two to three years and they come from a variety of different backgrounds um it's a complete myth that one background is better than another in my view um i think historically some might so if you go back five years before the creation of pcm <laughs> i think um pharmacists from hospital backgrounds might have found it easier um, I certainly don't think that's the case anymore. Um, the certainly my my um, juniors come from a variety uh, of backgrounds and levels of experience. I have one newly qualified pharmacist. She got onto the register last month. Um, uh, and at the opposite end of the spectrum, I've got one of my colleagues uh, who is who has been on the register thirty plus years, um, and they all bring something different. To the table. I would say um, having some, if, if you're coming at the beginning of your career, having some sort of experience within general practice obviously gives you a bit of an edge. And that might be through a part-time, um, a cross-sector placement or a joint pre-reg uh, opportunity. It might be, um, I mean, it's, I'm not saying you have to do this, but some people do um, you know, go and do a little bit of shadowing in general practice, um, you know, just so they can say, look, you know, I've done a little bit. That, that I'm not saying that's necessary at all. That's just what some people choose to do. Um, the It ultimately does depend a lot on who's hiring. Um, I think if, it, if it's GPs hiring, they'll have a particular kind of person they might be looking for. If it's pharmacists hiring, um, I think there's a lot more open-mindedness from my personal view, as to what kind of skills, what kind of person makes the best hire. Um, and for me, the best kind of person would be someone who is very much um, into sort of uh, preferred personal and professional development, um, is willing to take responsibility for a lot of learning that, that comes with um, any role. But within general practice, the learning curve is quite steep. Um, but and of course, you know, certainly within PCN roles, there's a lot of training through CPPE. You'll have to do your prescribing. Um, these aren't optional; um, they're, they're mandated by NHS England. Um, and that's a lot to keep on top of in terms of a yeah, you know, on top of a full time job. Um, so certainly, natural aptitude. Yeah, you know, there's there's got to be that there. But but ultimately, I think um, you know, attitude towards it all is far more important than your background. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, we've got so many questions. I know we're supposed to finish at six o'clock, it's 10 past. <clears throat> just want to take a few more questions and then um, if you have any more, I'll say join the Telegram. Kahido, just, to say, Kahido, just to say, there are other career paths as well. I've not touched on them, but there are other career paths for new, newly qualified. So you can look at pharma industry. So I've got friends who work in MHRA, uh, the pharma industry, in pharmaca vigilance, medical affairs. You would start at the, at the start of the career, you would be on a very a very low salary but you'll accelerate very quickly as you go through through um the changes and you start getting more qualifications within that area so you can become a final signatory there's there's, there's so many ways of going in you can become a farm vigilance officer and that's completely different but they still need clinical people so they are different ways of working and it's just not it, the world's opened up. Unfortunately, university doesn't teach us this. Nobody in the university lecturers stand there and say, you're going to do this career and this is what's going to be. So you have to learn a lot of it. You have to learn for yourself. But I guess that's where Tahida is here. And he's made this um, great cooperative for you guys. So any questions you have, I guess, for me, Paul, Alistair, Imran, Tahida, whoever, feel free to ask because we're here to help. Because nobody was there to help us. Um, and that's the way I look at it. So we, we've we've come from a, a tough background, I guess. But I guess if we don't help you guys, we're not going to have a better future, are we? 
True. I think um, <clears throat> and th- th- that was the whole point of the corporate that we we have everyone coming together and supporting each other. And everyone gives two minutes of their time in the day. And that's, you know, when there's 10, 15, 20,000 of us, that's a lot of experience. That's decades and t- uh, of worth of experience from each person uh, that they can give. Um, and there's a lot that you can learn from it. So feel free to ask. Don't, don't think that oh, so this is a stupid question. Um, you might be surprised a lot of people about, maybe thinking of the same thing they don't know the same uh same they may be facing the same issues so yeah just get on network ask uh join the network join the professional membership uh <clears throat> and a lot of people think that this you know if, if, if you're welcome then uh you can join and you can get access to the rates but it's the shifts but it's not really the cooperative isn't about just locums it's about the whole profession um so we need everyone's support um and that the, there's so many of us that have worked day and night for the last four or five years to build up this network that you can now see uh, and benefit from. Um, and you see us speaking up online uh, on, you see the articles that we've written and that's years and years of hard work to come together to build this. Um, so we do need everyone's support. Um, even, like I said, even if you work in hospital and you never use a platform, the work we do will have an impact on you because when you affect one part of the system, uh, the whole system changes. Um, and when local community pharmacies have a better rate, then the employed pharmacists have better salary uh, because it's cheaper to hire keep an employed pharmacist. And if employed pharmacists are on a high salary, then it'll have an impact on the hospital pharmacies because they'll want to switch uh, to community pharmacy. So then then it just wouldn't want to keep hold of them by paying them better salary. So you know, when you impact one side of this uh, sector, you impact every side. Um, and the aim of the cooperative is to improve the whole profession. Now we've got another 34 messages to go through. Um, I'm going to have to end it there if it's okay with everyone. And I'm, I promise the panel it'll just be one hour. Uh, like I said, jump, come on to the, the TPC network on Telegram um, and we'll try and answer all your questions. Um, there's like there's hundreds of us or thousands of us on there, uh, so we can we can all uh, support you. Uh, any last words from anyone? Uh, uh, if you want, if people want contact details, please can you provide contact details of uh, myself? If people want some kind of advice or anything, I'm happy. I'm happy to answer questions. And whoever comes to the farm show, just come along. Don't worry, I'm not scary. I'm a normal person, so you know you can come and talk. <laughs> Same here. I'm not scary. Uh, a lot of people think I am. Um, I had a reputation at uh, one of the universities I used to work in. Uh, people wouldn't come to me because uh, they thought I was the scariest character ever. I'm not. One thing I would say, though, is you know, a bit of general advice. Don't do stupid stuff. If you don't do stupid stuff, you're not going to get into trouble. If you do, GPHC will come and have a chat with you. So, you know, really just keep that in the back of your mind, the amount of people that do stupid things and then, you know, come to me to help them deal with it. Don't do the stupid stuff in the first place and you'll be absolutely fine. Uh, and I think actually we've we've done some uh, podcasts together, me and uh, Paul. <coughs> Again, I'll send you links to those videos. So you can see some of the stuff that people do get up to. Um, some very well-known pharmacists have got up to in the past as well. So yeah, um, don't do anything silly and you'll be fine. Uh, I'll be at the pharmacy show as well this uh, on the 17th and 18th. I'll be there both days. So if you've got any questions, feel free to ask um, when I'm there. And I think, Paul, you're, you're going to be there as well. Are you coming to the pharmacy show? Um, you're on mute. Are you coming to the pharmacy show? Oh, yes, I'll be there. Um, be there. I'm going to be uh, in the supervision crowd um at 2010 so i'll be there and uh making my views on remote supervision uh, very well known yes i think uh, that's another key area uh, and everyone's starting to go now but uh if you could just stay for one more a few more minutes uh remote supervision is a big topic and it's mm-hmm. there's a lot of uh, powerful organizations that are trying to push for remote supervision so i need you i need we need everyone to speak up uh, against remote supervision because uh, what will eventually happen is you'll have one pharmacy running four, five, six pharmacies. Um, and it's all about cost saving. It's not about improving the profession. It's not about improving the access. There isn't a shortage of pharmacies. There never has been. 
Like I know that there's a big thing about there's a big shortage of pharmacists now. What's happened is pharmacists are now asking for better rates. They the they've realized they can demand better rates, they can negotiate better rates. And to save costs, there's this big uh push for in 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 the in the media that to say that there is a shortage. Uh, there absolutely is no shortage at all. There's on average four pharmacists per pharmacy in the community. Um, what's happening is a lot of com uh, people, companies like Lloyd's uh, are finding it difficult to recruit uh, and retain their pharmacists and for very obvious reasons. Uh, but rather than admit that some of these companies have problems with retention or uh, hiring, <clears throat> what they're saying is there is no one to work for them. So um, we need everyone to speak up about these things, uh, expose these companies and the, the, the poor practices. So remote supervision is one one area. Um, <clears throat> pharmacy shortage is another area that they're pushing. Apprenticeship is another area that they're pushing for as well. So there's quite a few things that you, we as pharmacists need to push back against. Um, so yeah, come on along to the, come along to the uh, pharmacy show, um, and you can ask you can ask us any questions you like. Um, Imran, any last questions? Any last uh, messages before we go? Um, no, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So if you leave my number, uh, anyone's free to call and we can discuss their situation and work out what's best for them. Cool. Um, what I'll do is I'll email everyone who's registered for the event tonight, um, Imran's and uh, everyone else's uh, Twitter handle. Uh, and, uh, and I'll give Imran's contact details as well. Uh, and also Bilal um, and his link to his Curious app. Um, so you can all uh, ask him for advice or if you just need to have a chit chat with him. Uh, feel free. Um, Alistair, any last words? Uh, not from me, only that I hope it's been useful. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out to uh, uh, me, as others have said, on uh, Telegram and Twitter and things like that. Cool. Um, thanks, everyone. We had about 200 registered, uh, but we had at least 100 people on at one time. So uh, thanks for coming today. Um, thanks for all your questions. Um, again, please do join the Farms Cooperative um, and join as a professional member. Uh, your £30 a year goes a long way in supporting the work that we do. Um, and you can claim it back as an expense. You get the discounts on a lot of our products and services, which kind of gives you the money back anyway. So it's pretty much cost neutral to you. Uh, but having a large membership uh, gives us a stronger voice. Uh, and other organizations take us a lot more seriously when we have a large base. So uh, thanks again uh, and have a good evening.